Welcome and thank you for tuning into A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 with Lindsay, Manisha, Nilafar, Saunas, Isaiah, and Kristen. We are third year nursing student at Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo. We are here working to demystify health issues in and around our community, bringing you evidence based information about your healthcare options. This information is for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice of your primary health care provider. We like to start by acknowledging and thanking the Sunnimo First Nations, whose traditional territory we have the opportunity to learn, live, and share educational experiences on. We're going to be talking about substance use and addiction. You will be hearing from our hosts, Nilafar, Manisha, Lindsay, and Isaiah. That's me. And last but not least, you're going to be hearing from Healthy You Nanaimo, a group of third-year nursing students, and they're going to be talking about what they do in the community, opioid overdose, risk factors, and the signs and symptoms of overdose. To start the show, you're going to be hearing from Neela Farr, who will be giving you a fun fact of the day, followed by Your Opinion Matters, featuring some guest questionnaires from Nanaimo's community. After this, you will hear from Lindsay. She's going to be talking about drinking. And not just any drink, we're talking about alcohol here. And more specifically, the differences between and risks of binge drinking and chronic alcoholism. Following this, our host Manisha is going to be diving into some botany. For those who don't know, botany is the study of or science of plants. Yep, you guessed it, she's going to be talking about marijuana. She'll cover everything from the legalization of said plant, the various types, roots, content differences from past to now, how it affects brain chemistry, medical use, effects on mental health, and using the marijuanas while pregnant. And then you will hear from Healthy You Nanaimo, interviewed by myself for some sweet information. Without further ado, here is Nilafar. Hello, CHLY listeners. This is Nilafar, and today I would like to talk about adolescence drug addiction. Okay, why adolescence a critical time for preventing drug addiction? Teenagers are at a very critical age. They are going through a transition from childhood to maturity and have a lot of energy. They're looking for an outlet to show their flares and want to prove themselves and show that they are something rather productive and important. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse 2018, the use of drug at an early age increases the chance of becoming addicted. Since the use of drug conflicts with brain functionality and leads to addiction along with other serious health problems. So, preventing its use along with alcohol consumption may go a long way in reducing these health risks. Risk of drug use increases greatly during time of transition. Teens who may be at risk, including those who are in periods of transition, going from elementary to middle or middle to high school, means teens are often introduced to new pressures and influences. The younger teens may be encouraged to do drugs to fit in with the other crowds, and new social circles could introduce the teens to those who are already using drugs. Second, those who suffer from mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, and other mental health concerns that can manifest in children at a young age. Next, kids who don't have positive adult influences. Teens who come from broken or abusive homes are rarely aware of the consequences of drug abuse. Additionally, teens who grew up around family or caretakers who abuse drugs are far more likely to continue the cycle of abuse in their lives. A certain amount of risk-taking is a normal part of adolescence development. The desire to try new things and become more independent is healthy, but it may also increase teens' tendencies to experiment with drugs. The parts of the brain that control judgment and decision-making do not fully develop until people are in their early or mid-20s. This limits a teen's ability to accurately assess the risks of drug experimentation and makes young people more vulnerable to peer pressure. Because the brain is still developing, using drug at this age has more potential to disrupt brain function in areas critical to motivation, memory, learning, judgment, and behavior control. So it is not surprising that teens who use alcohol or other drug often have family and social problems poor academic performance, health-related problems, and involvement with the justice system. 
Educating teens on drug and alcohol risk is super important. As I mentioned before, the teenage brain is in a state of rapid development, which can lead to erratic behavior. So educating young people on the potential risk of abusing drugs and alcohol can enable them to make better choices. To talk to your teen about drugs, ask your teen's view. Avoid lectures. Instead, listen to your teen's opinions and questions about drugs. Assure your teen that he or she can be honest with you. Discuss reasons not to use drugs. Avoid scare tactics. Emphasize how drug use can affect the things that are important to your teen, such as sports, driving, health, and appearance. Consider media messages. Social media, television programs, movies, and songs can glamorize or trivialize drug use. Talk about what your teen sees and hears. Discuss ways to resist peer pressure. Brainstorm with your teen about how to turn down efforts of drugs. Be ready to discuss your own drug use. Think about how you'll respond if your teen asks about your own drug use. If you choose not to use drugs, explain why. If you did use drugs, share what the experience taught you. Thank you so much, Nilafar. We're going to take a quick break here, folks. Uh, this song is called When You Leave Town by The Breakman. Hope you enjoy it. Lie on her backs, look up at the clock. Let the damn you like just roll up and calm down. I always thought I'd see you flying by when your lightweight plane ain't up in the sky. When you left town, mm-hmm, the time. Since you've been gone, it seems fate. Lover in a window. I'm singing them We bought a house On the hippie side of town And every day The sun said There's a black cloud of crows Flying by When they leave town mm-hmm. Town changes mm-hmm. And until they come back Next time you play, I'll be in the crowd Fixed on you and dreaming that I'm in your song All those notes you found that now belong to you Take some with you on the road, please Old man, leave me a few When you left town Town changed mm-hmm. oh, But your record spins around Till it's faded And you go and let you live here happily, maybe. 
I found gold where you told me to look and traces of you on every path I took when you left town. Listening to a sound constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. This is Lindsay. Vancouver Coastal Health had reported that BC is the number one province for hospitalization caused solely by alcohol use. So, when does alcohol become unhealthy or dangerous? Binge drinking can increase your risk for alcohol poisoning. According to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Canada's largest mental health teaching hospital, binge drinking involves consuming many alcoholic beverages in one sitting. For it to be considered binge drinking, women would drink four or more beverages or alcoholic drinks in one sitting, and for men it would generally be five drinks or more. When the alcohol content in your body gets too high, the alcohol begins to act like poison which is what people mean when they say someone has alcohol poisoning. Alcohol poisoning and severe intoxication can be fatal if your stomach can't get rid of the alcohol by throwing up or getting it pumped out. It can result in seizures, comas, or even death. The RCMP has given some guidelines as to when you should call an ambulance. So if you're with a friend or, you know, anyone else who has been drinking, you would call an ambulance if you're unable to wake someone who has passed out from drinking too much. They are vomiting in their sleep. They start having seizures. They have slow or irregular breathing and heart rate. They are bluish, pale, or have cold skin. When you find someone in this position, make sure to stay with them until the ambulance arrives. You want to prevent them from choking on their own vomit by putting them in the recovery position. This will prevent them from stopping breathing or choking. For more information on binge drinking, you can visit the Center for Addiction and Mental Health website. C-A-M-H dot C-A. Health Canada is reminding Canadians, especially youth and young adults, about the potential risks associated with consuming caffeinated energy drinks that have been mixed with alcoholic beverages. Over the years, the mixing of caffeinated energy drinks with alcoholic beverages has become more popular, especially among young Canadians. The 2010 Canadian Alcohol and Drug Use Monitoring Survey showed that drinking caffeinated energy drinks with alcohol is seen more among youth and young adults than the general public. Also, this practice tends to be more prevalent in university and college environments. So why is it a problem? When drinking caffeinated energy drinks that have been mixed with alcohol, consumers may not feel the symptoms of alcohol intoxication and the caffeine of the energy drink may mask the drowsiness associated with the alcohol intake. This may increase the potential for dehydration and overconsumption of alcohol, which could lead to alcohol poisoning and alcohol-related injury. 
It is also worth noting that Health Canada has not approved the sale of any prepackaged, premixed, alcoholic, caffeinated energy drinks. Another dangerous drinking pattern is chronic alcoholism, also known as also known as alcohol use problem. Um, so it can sometimes be hard to know when you begin to drink too much. HealthLink BC gives us some guidelines as to how we can know when our drinking is becoming an alcohol use problem. Uh, so some of the signs that you are drinking too much are, for men it would be three standard drinks a day on most days or more than 15 drinks a week. For women, it would be two standard drinks a day on most days or more than 10 drinks a week. Other signs also include when you're drinking, even though you know drinking, the drinking is causing problems in your life, or if you have a strong need or craving to drink. Some other signs include you can't control how much you drink, uh, you find it hard to stop drinking after you have started, or you find it hard to abstain from drinking for more than a few hours or a few days. You are often drunk for long periods of time. You don't remember what you did while you were drinking, so you have blackout moments. You have tried to reduce the amount of alcohol you use, but you haven't been able to. You have problems at school or work because of your drinking. Problems may include finding it hard to concentrate, being late, or just not going into work or school some days. You get into arguments after you've been drinking and then later regret the things you said or did. You have legal problems because of your drinking, such as being arrested for harming someone or driving while drunk. You have withdrawal symptoms when you stop drinking, especially in the morning. These include sweating and feeling sick to your stomach, feeling shaky, and feeling anxious. You need to drink more to get the same effect as you had once before. You make excuses for your drinking or you do things to hide your drinking, such as buying alcohol at different stores. You give up on other activities so you can drink. You keep drinking even though it harms your relationships and causes health problems. So what are, what are the effects of alcohol use problems? It can be dangerous in a number of ways. The impact of alcohol affects your judgment, behavior, attitude, and reflexes can range from embarrassment to unwanted or high-risk sexual contact to violence, injury, or death. Alcohol is involved in more regrettable moments, crimes, and traffic fatalities than all other drugs of abuse combined. Women who drink during pregnancy risk giving birth to a baby with behavior problems, growth deficiency, developmental disability, head and facial deformities, joint and limb abnormalities, and heart defects. The risk of having a child with these birth defects increases with the amount of time of alcohol consumed. The first trimester may be the time of greatest risk, although there is no time during pregnancy when it is known to be safe to drink. Mixing alcohol with other drugs can have unpredictable results. Alcohol may either block the absorption of the other drug making it less effective, or it may increase the effect of the other drug to the point of danger. The general rule is to never mix alcohol with any other drugs, whether other drugs is a medication or an illegal substance. If you are taking medication and you want to drink, you should check with your doctor first or a ph pharmacist. So those are the short-term effects of alcohol use. So let's look at some of the long-term effects. The long-term effects of alcohol use depends on how much and how often you drink. Research studies have shown that as little as one drink of alcohol every other day can help protect middle-aged and older adults against heart disease. One to two drinks a day can increase your risk of developing certain cancers. Three or more 
drinks a day increases your risk of high blood pressure, stroke, and heart problems. Heavy alcohol use can result in trouble getting and keeping an erection for men or menstrual irregularities for women. Alcohol use may cause appetite loss, vitamin deficiencies, and infections. It also irritates the lining of the stomach, which can be painful and is potentially fatal. Alcohol increases the risk of liver, throat, breast, and other cancers. Alcohol liver disease is a major cause of illness and death in North America. So uh, long-term use of alcohol also has psychological effects because it can damage the brain, can lead to dementia, difficulties with coordination and motor control, and loss of feeling or painful burning in the feet. Alcohol dependence often results in clinical depression, and the rate of suicide among people who are dependent on alcohol is six times that of the general population. So all this information and more can be found at the camh.ca website. That's the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Canada's largest teaching hospital. So if you have an alcohol use problem, uh, there are some resources here in Nanaimo that you can access. Island Health does have a list of these resources and other resources for drug and alcohol use on their website. The first resource that I found was the Alcohol and Drug Information Referral Service. This provides a free confidential information and referral service to British Columbians in need of support with any kind of substance use issue. Um, That would be alcohol or other drugs. Uh, Referral to community substance use treatment services is available for all ages. Information available from the Alcohol and Drug Information Referral Service includes prevention resources, support groups, and addiction-related topics such as fetal alcohol syndrome. To contact them, you can call them at 1-800-663-1441. They do have a multilingual telephone assistance available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is uh, funded through the Ministry of Health and provided by BC211. Another resource here in Nanaimo is the Alcoholics Anonymous Support Line. Uh, You can reach them at 250-753-7513. So that was information on alcohol use. Thank you for listening. This is Lindsay with A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We're going to take another quick little break here uh, featuring a song by Capade called Wake Me Up.
another day I'm out of lives and out of strength hey, Help me get it out the way Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. I'm going to discuss about marijuana for a few minutes. Marijuana, also called wheat, herb, pot, grass, bud, ganja, Mary Jane, and a vast number of other slang terms. It is a greenish gray mixture of the dried flowers of cannabis sativa. The strains are commonly broken up into two distinct groups, indica and sativa. Indica strains are believed to be physically sedating, perfect for relaxing with the movie. Sativa tend to provide more uplifting cerebral effects that pair well with physical activity, social gatherings, and creative projects. The laws related to marijuana has been changed since 2018. Here are some changes as per Government of Canada. The Cannabis Act creates a strict legal framework for controlling the production, distribution, sale, and possession of cannabis across Canada. The Act aims to accomplish three goals. Keep cannabis out of the hands of youth. Keep profits out of pockets of criminals. Protect public health and safety by allowing adults access to legal cannabis. So what is legal as of October 17, 2018? Provincial restrictions applies to marijuana. Adults who are 18 years of age or older are legally able to possess up to 30 grams of legal cannabis, dried or equivalent in non-dried form in public. They also can share up to 30 grams of legal cannabis with other adults and buy dried or fresh cannabis and cannabis oil from provincially licensed retailers. In provinces and territories without regulated retail framework, individuals are able to purchase cannabis online from federally licensed producers. Marijuana contains cannabidiol, also known as CBD, and this is not a psychoactive compound. The main psychoactive, mind-altering chemical in marijuana, responsible for most of the intoxicating effects that people see, is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, also known as THC. Many people experience pleasant euphoria and sense of relaxation. Other common effects, which may vary among different people, include heightened sensory perception, laughter, altered perception of time, and increased appetite. Instead of relaxation and euphoria, some people experience anxiety, fear, distrust, or panic. These effects are more common when a person takes too much or the marijuana has an unexpectedly high potency. People who have taken large doses of marijuana may experience an acute psychosis, which includes hallucinations, delusions, and a loss of sense of personal identity. These unpleasant but temporary reactions are distinct from longer-lasting psychotic disorders, such as schizophrenia, that may be associated with the use of marijuana in vulnerable individuals. So how does marijuana work? Endogenous cannabinoids, such as anandamide, function as neurotransmitters because they send chemical signals between nerve cells throughout the nervous system. They affect brain areas that influence pleasure, memory, thinking, concentration, movement, coordination, and sensory and time perception. THC mimics the anandamide in the brain. Because of this similarity, 
THC is able to attach the receptors on neurons and activate them. This gives us that euphoria effect because THC is way stronger than anandamide. As a result, using marijuana causes impaired thinking and interferes with the person's ability to learn and perform complicated tasks. Marijuana significantly impairs judgment, motor coordination, and reaction time. And studies have found that a direct relationship between blood THC concentration and impaired driving ability. Those involved in vehicle crashes with THC in their blood, particularly high levels, are three to seven times more likely to be responsible for the incident than drivers who had not used drugs or alcohol. The risk associated with marijuana in combination with alcohol appears to be greater than for either drug by itself. It is illegal to drive while being under the effects of marijuana in Canada. Marijuana use in adolescent years is a rising health concern in Canada. With the legalization of marijuana, there is a high chance that early marijuana use may continue to increase amongst our youth. Marijuana is legalized for anyone above 18, but our brain does not fully develop until the age of 25. Therefore, it can significantly affect the brain development, not just in adolescents, but also in young adults. Here is the audio clip called Effects of Cannabis on Teenage Brain, funded by NCPIC and Turning Point and produced by String Theory Creative. The content is written by Lubman, Manning, and Kyle. And the audio is retrieved from Cannabis Information and Support Channel on YouTube. During our teenage years, how we interact with the world changes. We seek out new interests and experiences, take more risks, and spend more time with our friends and less with our family. These behaviours have developed through evolution to make sure we push ourselves so that we learn to become independent from our parents. By putting ourselves in new and challenging situations, different parts of our brain learn to work together, forming brain circuits that can communicate with each other rapidly to help us respond in different ways. Ensuring that our brain is wired in the right way during the teenage years with strong and healthy brain circuits is critical to our future and how we get the most out of life. Three of the most important circuits that are developing during this period are those involved in learning and memory, motivation and mood. Learning and memory circuits control our ability to receive, store and recall information. Our motivation circuit is supported by an inbuilt reward system that helps us to decide if something is important and whether we should do something to get it. Our mood is shaped by emotional circuits that interpret how we experience and react to different situations and interactions. Making sure these particular circuits wire in the right way during our teenage years is the brain's own occupational health and safety, the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system is a complex and delicate brain system which helps to fine-tune communication within these circuits, ensuring the wiring is assembled correctly, damaged cells are repaired, and the right connections are strengthened for the future. When looking into the effect of cannabis on the brain, scientists found that we naturally produce a brain chemical called anandamide that is similar to cannabis. Concentrations of anandamide are delicately calibrated for it to accomplish its critical role within the endocannabinoid system. This is why, if we add cannabis into the brain, it causes the endocannabinoid system to become flooded with cannabis chemicals. It's a bit like dumping a bucket of salt on your chips instead of a pinch. Or like stadium speakers being plugged into your iPod. Constantly disrupting the endocannabinoid system with cannabis impacts how your brain develops, and in particular, how the mood, motivation, and learning and memory circuits get wired. Short-term memory loss is a common characteristic of long-term heavy cannabis use, because when you use cannabis, less information gets saved as memories. This is why it's harder to learn and remember new information, which can lead to significant drops in school grades. Cannabis can reduce your ability to focus attention, to organise yourself and make decisions, not just when you're using cannabis, but for weeks afterwards. Cannabis use can also lead to loss of motivation. Heavy users can feel detached and disinterested in things they used to like, such as sports, hobbies and catching up with friends. It can also lead to low self-confidence that in turn affects your mood, 
making it more difficult to manage everyday stresses, worries and frustrations, which can result in prolonged low mood, anxiety and depression. While these effects are commonly experienced by people who use cannabis regularly, new research suggests that these effects are worse and more permanent for people who start using cannabis while their brain is still developing. This is because the endocannabinoid system plays a central role in the development of your neural circuitry during the teenage years. The developing brain has a pretty good blueprint to work off, but our experiences and interactions with the outside world also help to shape these neural circuits that we will rely on as adults. Your teenage years are an adventure that sets you up for life. Enjoy the ride and look after your brain. It's the only one you've got. That was the audio clip called Effects of Cannabis on Teenage Brain, funded by NCPIC and Turning Point and produced by String Theory Creative. The content is written by Liebman, Manning, and Kyle, and it is retrieved from Cannabis Information and Support Channel on YouTube. As mentioned in it, marijuana can have some serious effects on developing brain. There are several psychological risks that can affect the individual throughout the ages of their brain growth. In the article, Marijuana Trajectories in Canadian Youth, Associations with Substance Use, and mental health. Ames, Leadbeater, and Thompson specifies that the chronic users usually have greater occurrence of behavioral difficulties and illegal activities compared to others. Outcome of this study also suggests that higher incidence of ADHD are associated with chronic use of marijuana. The article called Association Between Cannabis and Psychosis by Gage, Hickman, and Zamet concentrates on the relation between marijuana use and the occurrence of psychosis or schizophrenia. The result of this empirical study proves that marijuana users who start using it at a younger age are more likely to develop psychosis or schizophrenia. Long-term marijuana use also increases the probability of developing other mental illnesses. There is a 2% chance of developing schizophrenia for adolescent marijuana users with no genetic history of mental illness whereas the risk increases to 20% for the ones with family history of mental illness. This study also indicates that CBD has been confirmed to have antipsychotic properties. A study was conducted on youth. A study was conducting a study was conducted on youth aged 25 or younger to link the relevance of use of marijuana with evidence of psychosis, depression, or anxiety by Hossini and Oremus. The results specify that marijuana use can cause both short-term and long-term psychological effects on the developing brain. These effects include, but are not limited to, as mentioned above, psychosis, schizophrenia, ADHD, anxiety, and depression. Therefore, age of accessibility to marijuana should be over the age that is associated with the risk of these psychiatric diseases. Despite of all these effects, marijuana also has medicinal properties and is used for several treatments. Marijuana use has been debated in the past, and finally, it is legal in Canada. But the public, especially young adults, must make informed choices and decisions on the basis of credible information available. For more information, visit the Government of Canada website and also National Institute of Drug Abuse. Thank you so much, Manisha. That's excellent information. Up next, we have Your Opinion Matters. Check it out. Hey, hey you. Who, me? Yeah, you. We want to hear what you have to say because Your Opinion Matters. A uh, VIU student here willing to answer a question. What do you think of the recent legalization of marijuana? It's really good, but the prices went up, so that's really sad. Uh, I, I think it's fine. I think there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, if people want to smoke marijuana, and it's a lot of money for the government, like if you want to smoke marijuana and have a good time and you're not bothering anyone else, there's n nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. Um, what program are you taking? I am in my last year of a Bachelor of Science in a psych degree. Excellent. That's very cool. So what do you think of the recent legalization of marijuana, and do you think it's a gateway drug? I think that the recent legalization of marijuana is a really good thing. I think that it allows the government to regulate 
marijuana in a safer way. I know there's a lot of controversy over that, the price point and stock market stuff, but I think at the end of the day, it just creates a safer way for people to um, get a substance that they are going to use anyways. I think that using marijuana sort of reduces the fear of other drugs that people might have maybe before they started using marijuana. However, I don't believe that marijuana is inherently a gateway drug. Um, I think that people are far more likely to use other drugs that they might not seek out when they're sober, um, when under the influence of alcohol, because it reduces inhibition where where I feel people are less likely to seek out drugs um, that they might not seek out sober when they're under the influence of marijuana, just because it doesn't lower inhibition as much as alcohol does. So in that way, I would say, no, I don't think marijuana is a gateway drug. Thank you so much. We have another student from VIU here. Um, which population group do you think is most likely to be using drugs or alcohol? Which population group? Yeah, so like children, adolescents, teenagers, adults. Oh, teenagers for sure. Teenagers? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your input. I'm here with another student from Vancouver Island University. Do you mind telling me what program you're taking? I'm doing a double major in criminology and psychology. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, what are some things you think cause drug addiction or excessive alcohol use? Um, in my experience, patients are usually using drugs to cope with the daily stressors of the life, and um, because of the withdrawal symptoms being so intense, they don't really know how to stop abusing the drugs. Uh, most of the opioid addictions are due to patients abusing drugs that were prescribed to them um, for managing pain for past surgeries. Thank you so much. And now we have Healthy You Nanaimo joining us. So, Jessica, can you explain what it is that Healthy You Nanaimo is doing in the community? Thanks, Isaiah. So we're a third-year nursing student community placement that works with uh, VIU students and staff to increase, to increase their health through accessible health teaching and uh, harm reduction. We do a lot of uh, raising awareness of stigma related to substance use, sexual health, and mental health. Lately, we've been doing a lot of naloxone training uh, through Towards the Heart, and we've been providing kits to students and staff. Yeah, our other initiatives include, like, we've got a wellness cardiovascular clinic that we do in the fall and the spring. We're doing uh, some mental health teaching and our naloxone training. So why train students in naloxone? Our goal is to increase awareness of the overdose crisis that's currently going on. We want to create open dialogue regarding substance use, uh, confront stigma, and really empower VIU students to exercise social responsibility. Opioid use can occur across like all sociodemographic populations. You know, there's prescribed opioids in the hospital uh, and at home. People don't use all of these medications. They might get stolen or sold or abused. And then there's a population of people who start using substances to self-medicate themselves. And then also people who have, you know, experienced trauma or abuse, they might turn to substance use to, to help deal with that. So the stigma associated with drug use causes some people to use underground. Like I said, it occurs across sociodemographic populations. So it's not, it's not just like the vulnerable homeless population that we think of, you know, middle, upper class people also use substances. And because of the stigma, they're more likely to use alone, to use in basements, to use in bathrooms, which is really dangerous. Uh, with my work in volunteering, I've responded to overdoses before. And another one of our group in Healthy VIU has had a family member afflicted uh, with addiction who used substances, and they actually overdosed a couple of times in their family home. So he didn't have naloxone training to respond to that situation, and it really would have benefited him. And that's just it. We come from a harm reduction approach, and that's what we teach in our sessions. So what do you mean by a harm reduction approach? So the whole harm reduction philosophy is kind of a set of practical strategies and ideas that are aimed at reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use. It like seeks to recognize and respect people's self-determination. Um, it's really to reduce risks. And uh, in nursing, we learn about the stages of change. And a harm reduction philosophy really acknowledges that continuum of substance use. So it's really meeting people where they're at. If they're not 
ready to stop using substances, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be using it safely. So that's basically the main focus is meeting people where they're at and not where we want them to be. And the biggest barrier is, barrier is the stigma that people who use substance face. Harm reduction is not about taking away from others. It's about providing the appropriate and effective care that people need. And the evidence behind harm reduction is really pretty overwhelming. There's a lot that says that these approaches improve health outcomes and lead to lower costs. Can you talk a little bit about the overdose crisis? Yeah, so the government actually declared a public health emergency in April 2016. So from 2016 to 2018, there's more than 9,000 opioid-related deaths in Canada. And during that time, British Columbia had 4,000 drug-related deaths. Last year in BC, it was nearly 1,500 people who died. And like this has made a lot of people angry in the substance using community because they don't feel like anything's really being done to address this. So organizations around the country are actually planning uh, some awareness raising events. So in Nanaimo, we have an organization called New Leaf, which is a peer-led group that does outreach and hosts, uh, they host a safe consumption site. So they're the ones who are doing plans for Nanaimo. Thank you so much for that excellent information. Something that really interests me is I want to know what some of the risk factors are and what are some of the signs and symptoms that we can be aware of. So mixing substances uh, is one of the risk factors. So opioids are a central nervous system depressant. So the main, main issue that happens when somebody overdoses on opioids is respiratory depression. Their breathing rate goes down. So mixing substances that also produce that effect, like alcohol or uh, benzodiazepine, just potenti- potentiates that effect. And then, like I was just saying, the quantity and the potency of drugs. So if you don't know how strong the drug is, take it. The drug you're taking is uh, that's a risk factor. Uh, the route. A lot of people inject opioids, but you can also snort them and smoke them. Some other risk factors are are tolerance. So someone with like a low tolerance, someone who's opioid naive, like in the hospital when we're first giving opioid medication, someone who's never had it, we we really try and start slow. Um, Also tolerance, like if someone has been abstaining for a while, if they're recently gone to prison or if they've just been clean for a little while and then they start using the same amount that they were using before they had that break in substance use. that puts them at risk. Um, health status, so if they have liver or kidney dysfunction, if they have some kind of infection, um, if they're not eating well enough, all that kind of decreases our body's ability to basically respond. And setting of use, so using alone is really, really, really dangerous basically because of the increase of potency of the drugs we're finding but also using in unfamiliar environments. So this is really, really super interesting uh, research by this uh, fella named Shepard Siegel into the con- compensatory drug response. So it's basically like a conditioned response. So for someone who's using substances regularly in the same environment, their body will become conditioned to that stimuli. So their body and their brain is going to unconsciously be like, oh, okay, get ready for this substance, and the body is going to kind of work to compensate, you know, through homeostasis to mitigate the effects of that drug. So when the same person uses in an unfamiliar environment, that conditioned response is is not going to be as strong because the initial stimuli, the environment, will be different. So that person can potentially overdose using a similar dose in, like, an unfamiliar environment. Um, And then you also asked about the signs and symptoms So a big one is being unresponsive to stimulation. So if someone is, you know, maybe sleeping and you call out their name and they wake up, they're they're probably fine. Um, If they're not responding and not responding to painful stimulation, like a sternal rub, so you take the hard part of your knuckles and basically rub it in the middle of their chest really hard. Uh, That's what we do in a clinical setting to kind of rouse people. So if they're unresponsive to that kind of painful stimulation, that's a big sign that I mean, if you find anyone in that state, you're going to call 911 first off. But some other signs and symptoms are slow and shallow breathing. So that's the main um, side effect that we're looking at, the respiratory depression. 
So that person might have slow and shallow breathing. Um, they could also be snoring and gurgling. And then because their respiratory rate is so low, they're not going to be oxygenating as well. So they could have blue lips, uh, blue fingertips, and they might be cold and clammy. This is excellent information for um, the public to get a hold of. Uh, what can we do? So when we do our, our naloxone training sessions, we have a, a few tips. Like we try and go in with no assumptions. Um, you know, that's just it. We really don't know who is using. Um, so we always try and give some tips to, you know, tell tell someone who you might be who might be using or for people who might be using. So a big one is obviously having a buddy. You don't want to use alone. Um, you want to tell people how much you're using if possible. Um, beware of mixing. So avoid using alcohol. Um, if you do intend on mixing, maybe start with less of each and wait. Uh, test a small amount, uh, especially when changing routes or substances. And uh, as nursing students in the hospital, when we're starting a new medication, we know that uh, you want to start low and go slow. So that's what we also tell people. And then carry naloxone and call 911 if someone ODs. So there's various suppliers that are that can provide you with uh, naloxone. Towards the Heart is the organization that our group works with for all of our training supplies and naloxone kits. They're really a great re resource on their site. They have a list of pharmacies that can provide you with a kit. They also have training videos on their site um, telling you how to administer naloxone. Well, thank you so much for coming in. That's excellent information, and I can't wait to get it out to the public on our next show here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And that was Jessica on behalf of A Healthy You Nanaimo. I'm so grateful, and I know the rest of A Sound Constitution is as well, to have them as part of our show. That's all we have for today, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be finishing up with another song here by Seven Day Myth. This song is called My Asylum. Have a great day, everyone, and stay healthy. We'll catch you next time. As we come to the end of the episode, we encourage you to reach out to your healthcare practitioner and other health professionals for more information. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, check out our Facebook page for resources from today's show. If there is anything you would like to hear us talk about, let us know by email at asoundconstitution at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM.
so 